folks, welcome back to Gardening with Ray in the Cusp. So we're going to start out in the grow room. And as you can see, it's all full up again. So this is the warm season crops that we're starting now. So the beans, the squash, the cucumbers, the corn. Um, I started, used to start them in the greenhouse in hills there where I had a shorter season. And I just kept doing it just because it works, it works well for me. And I wanted to put a disclaimer on. Um, I'm just showing you the way I garden. And I garden this way partly because I'm short of time sometimes. I'm also a little bit of short of space compared to when I had acreage in hills. So, but if you have your systems down where you do um, companion planting, planting by the moon, just keep on with your system. Uh, I'm not trying to say this is the right way to go. I'm just pointing out what I do and if some pointers are great for you, that's wonderful. And if they're not, that's okay too. You just see what's happening in my garden. So um, the squash, the cucumbers and the beans are all started in four inch pots. And I find if you leave them in there a little while, the, the pot gets nice and full. Uh, some people say they're hard to transplant, but I just, once the pot is kind of full of roots, you just tip them over and plant them out and there's been no um, shock to the plants at all. The only thing I don't start in the four inch pots are the corn. And I, I start those in the plug trays. So that's these here. And I don't let them sit there that long. The corn's usually about this high and the plug tray is just nice and full of roots but not totally root bound. And I just pull them out and plug them into the garden and away they go. And this way I am I know what's coming up and uh, I can just fill my garden with everything that's just growing and doing well. So that's that's what's happening in the grow room now. So now we'll, we'll go outside. <laughs> so now we're in the front yard and every once in a while we'll talk a little bit about landscaping tips. Now when I first moved here it was a big flat piece of lawn and I wanted to create some interest in it. So I created this berm, and the berm is just a raised pile of soil. And I've been using these rocks that I got from Russell Hop as a retaining wall to hold the soil in place. And from Russell, I got these beautiful front rocks here. So I created a, a staircase, a stone staircase, hardscape. Now the hardscape is just patios, concrete, uh, paving stones, anything that's not plant material. Uh, so that's your hardscape and your softscape is all the plant material. So I created this pathway here and then this beautiful stone staircase hardscape that starts at the end of the pathway and then goes up into this berm here. Now if you want to create the illusion of length in the path, what you do is you start out with the path wide at this end and then narrow it down. And you know how I was, when you look at a road and off in the distance it gets narrower. So this has the illusion that it's a big distance over there because it gets narrowed down that way. And also you can use the, I use a nice winding effect to make it feel like it's longer too as well. If I would have made a straight path with no uh, delineation of narrowness at that end, it wouldn't have looked so nice. But now we have this nice curve to it. It gets narrow at that end. So it looks like you're way down over that way. Mm -hmm. And then you have this nice staircase so you, and then the path winds around the corner there, so you want to go and explore, and it, it uh, creates interest in the garden. I do want to explore. <laughs> so rather than just being a, a flat path, a flat lawn here, it's got interest to it. Certainly does. Wow. When you put it like that, <laughs> I really appreciate it a lot more. Go up. Even more windiness. Amazing. To the potatoes and the kale. Oh, dee. <laughs> now, while we're over here, we might as well come into this garden here. Sure. <clears throat> so this is, um, as we mentioned before, this is my sting nettle patch, which I really prize. And I've been making uh, spring green soup, and maybe I'll even put a recipe in. Maybe we can, I can write it down, we can take a picture of it, and put the recipe in, because it's a really nice spring tonic to have spring green soup. And Deb Guest gave me an artichoke, a globe artichoke. And it's pretty rooty here from all these shrubs. 
and so perennials can um, compete with roots, tree roots, better than, than annuals. So I'm going to make this little circle here. I'm going to put my globe artichoke here, and that's the um, you know the big the big artichokes that uh, the Mediterranean type artichokes. So I'm going to plant that here. That would be a great spot for it. And I used to grow them in hills, and in the winter time I would just pile them up with leaves because they're kind of a little bit marginally hardy for here. But if you gave a big pile of leaves around them that made them through the winter time, then you just would cover them in the spring and up they come. How big does an artichoke plant get? Oh, about this uh, high, whoa. when it's doing well. Oh, that's about five feet. Yeah. <laughs> that's me. Yes. <laughs> okay, so yeah. leave a lot of space. Yes, that's right. Lots of space. Yeah. Because I got one of those too. All oh, right. yes. <laughs> I think I might have to yeah. reassess. I mean, well, maybe you get that the first year, but after a few years, yeah. Oh, it comes back? Oh, yes. Yeah, well, that's the leaves, the leaves. We're going to mulch it in the fall with leaves and hopefully that'll keep it from freezing. Oh. Because yeah. uh, it takes a while to get it really well established. And so you want it to come back year after year. And so we'd probably in about three years. It's like the asparagus. Just like the asparagus. Yeah. That's what it, I was it thinking. It gets better and better as it ages. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> Exciting. Yeah. And All I'll right. probably put my, um, my lemon balm here that I got from you, Joe. <laughs> I'm going to put it over there too because again it's a perennial mm -hmm. and it'll compete with this so and it can go a little bit wild but that's fine. Um, it's, since I can't grow a lot of greens or stuff in here really well I'm going to convert it over to perennial crops and uh, use it for that. So last week when I mentioned the other peony was the first peony to come out I was wrong. This is the first peony to come out. So this is the fern leaf peony. And it doesn't have a different colored leaf, it's just a green leaf, but it creates interest just because of, of its just the shape of the leaves. They're just an incredible, incredibly interesting shape. Now the flower doesn't last long. This is a single fern leaf peony, and I have a double fern leaf peony as well too. But they're, they're just gorgeous. They, uh, and even when they're, they're finished blooming, the, uh, the leaves look great. Everybody always says, what is that? <laughs> now we know. Yeah. A peony. So this is the double peony and it's finally, uh, I've had it here now for three years and it's finally getting a, a reasonable stature to it. Before it was just so small it didn't make much of a show but now it's starting to look good and, and the blooms are just gorgeous, that full full rich color to it, just beautiful. And again the nice fern leaf to it as well, it's very attractive. So this is a Caria japonica. So the genus is Caria. The species name is japonica. And now Latin can tell us a little bit of information. So japonica just means it's native to Japan. Say like, uh, say hosta albo marginata, it just means there's a white margin. Or oreo marginata, it just means there's gold margin. So um, we shouldn't be intimidated by Latin, uh, although sometimes it's hard to say the words, but it actually can teach us stuff about the plant too as well. Uh, Cornus canadensis means it's native to Canada. So it's, uh, we can learn a lot from the Latin names. So this is a, a nice shrub for shade. You can see it's growing in the shade here. It's a, quite a tough plant. Now I use it, uh, like at the Kohan Garden there, we have it growing below the cedar trees where not much else will grow. And if you don't have it growing in a tough conditions, it can kind of really spread. So if you put it in your nice ornamental garden where you have lots of perennials and stuff like that, it can spread and be kind of a little bit of a pain. But um, say here, where there's just ivy around it, it's just fine, and doesn't it just you know stays in its place quite nicely. So yeah, so a wonderful plant for spring color and for shade. It just brightens up the shade immensely. So that's Caria japonica. Now right next door, I have a series of rhododendrons here, and this one's a little bit. Uh, you can see it's still some of the old wood in here. I've been cutting it back and. The other ones are bushing out nicely, but this one's a little, takes a little bit of time. But uh, the rhododendrons are nice for shade again, and they're evergreen, so they keep their leaves year round. So if you wanted to create a, a border with a neighbor, they're nice for that. They don't lose their leaves in the, in the winter time. Uh, sometimes if it's really cold, they kind of hang down, but, uh, and they have their own certain time of blooms too as well. This is one of the first ones to bloom. And you can just see just the, the buds have a beautiful color and then they open up just a little bit paler. And to me, they remind me of orchids. They're just so gorgeous that way. It's the, the flecking inside there. It's just uh, beautiful. Wow. 
gorgeous. I'm just going to take a look from here to see. I know the other ones are all pretty tight yet. So with different varieties, you can have different colors and different blooming times. So you can extend your bloom, you know, for, for months, say, even. And if you're in New Denver at the Kohan Garden there, we have quite a display of rhododendrons there. And I haven't been down there lately, but I heard that the show is becoming really nice down there. Thanks. And then there's purple. That's brown. Oh, and then this guy, he, oh, he does have some. This one's quite a, quite a pale pink. Oh. Just stunning. And when they all start to come out, yeah, I love seeing like just the little buds. So stay tuned. So now we're out into the beet and the carrot garden. So now beets come in all kinds of colors, yellows and oranges and reds. And I love it when you do um, like a mixed uh, vegetable bake. And you have the purple carrots, or purple carrots, and orange carrots, and uh, uh, yellow beets, and red beets, and purple potatoes. It just looks wonderful. So I, uh, I like to grow these. This variety of boldor is a, a golden beet. And then over there, I'll show you. We're going to plant them up. That's a nice red beet. And so you, when you pick your seeds, um, you plan the seeds for what you're going to do. Like these. This is my early eating. This is my summer eating, uh, spring and summer eating. And for the winter time, for the storage, then I, there's special varieties, like this variety, Miami Hybrid Organic Carrot, is a special variety for storage. And then there's beets that are special for storage too. So this is my early eating crop. So it's just a nice early, early bunching beet and carrot, and uh, they have nice sweetness to them as well. Now, the one problem with the carrots is the carrot rust fly. And it's really quite a problem. Um, there's three generations of carrot rust fly in, on a good or a bad year. There's late May, late July, and late September. So I do a small planting now, and I know I'm in into the May, late May crop. Uh, but for my my storage carrots, I try and plant them around in, in July and try to miss, you know, the later uh, bugs. And you can also put a fro floating row cover on, the Rime. Um, it's sort of a little bit of awkward because when the foliage is growing up and you have to tuck it down. So I haven't got into it yet. And so far, the, my damage hasn't been really bad. I mean, it's, uh, I have to cut stuff out of the storage carrots, but I can still eat my crop. So I guess when the, if it gets even worse, then I'll think about trying to use the Rime covers. You can also, it's really good to plant them in different, different places every year don't use the same spot. So uh, this is now again what we talked about last week. I put the burlap sack on top uh, because it keeps the soil nice and moist. So once I've got them seeded and you can see over here I have this nice fine potting soil. So I, I make the roll and I seed them and then I put this nice potting soil on top so it's easy for the plants to get through that. So I'm not sure if Joe, if you can, uh, oh, and I um, put my cultivator down. So now I know I can just cultivate through just to get rid of the weeds. Smart. And now I'm making probably a shadow here for you, Joe. So luckily the beets, beet seeds are bigger. Actually, I'm gonna put it in my hand. I think that'd be the best way to show that. So we're going to space them, oh, about an inch apart. I know even after all these years of planting, I think, oh, I should see them closer because something's going to happen to them. And then they all come up and then I got to spend the time thinning them, which is always a chore too. So I'm going to go about three quarter inch, inch apart. And like I say, the beet seeds are nice, though sometimes you're lucky and they put an organic covering on the carrot seeds and that makes them bigger and then they're easy to plant otherwise you just got to try the best you can I was going to show you how we do them too but I just got carried away and got them all planted <laughs> gotta do what you gotta do right yeah 
So there, I don't know if you can see there, 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 there. Man, it's tough. Can I see your hand? Cool. Yep, so we got them seated. I just give them a little tap to get them into the soil. What's that you got there, right? This is the potting soil, the nice soft potting soil. So I just put a little layer of that on top. And so it's nice for them to break through that. Oh, and when I prepared the bed, I didn't use any compost in this bed. I just used manure. And then I took the fork, the spading fork, and worked it through and tried to get all the lumps out. Because you, you want the soil to be nice and loose and easy so the carrots and beets can get into the soil and make nice long vegetables. Yeah, so just like that. And then just give a little tap down. And then I would put the sack on top. And then I would take uh, a water wand on the hose and then just with the water wand, just gently water it. And the sack will keep it from eroding the soil away from the seeds. And, uh, and then you just keep checking uh, probably It'd probably take about a week or so. Um, if it stayed warm like this, it'd probably be quite fast. But I hear that the today is the 15th, 16th <laughs> of May. And I hear the weather's going to change next week. It's going to get back to cooler again. So it could take a little bit longer then. But then you just keep lifting it up and checking. And hopefully within a week or a week and a half, they're, they're coming up. And then you can take the sack away. And then it's easier to look after them once they're established. So that's it for the carrots and the beets. Thanks. So now we're out of the tomato patch and as you can see over here I've got a lot of them planted out already and these romas I like to grow them in pots on my patio and then I can just pick them for salads. So because they were crammed in the greenhouse they were holding each other up so it's like like when you have a cast on you know you, you, you lose your muscle tone so these guys are a little bit weak uh, because they've been held together and what I do with when I plant these is I take off the bottom things please and then I put in a couple I probably put about three bales of compost here so it's quite nice and deep and I dug a hole down as deep as I could and I plant these guys like as deep as I can so when I planted them in these pots they went from the four inch pot into here and I stuck them right at the bottom so you can see how the stem just roots along the whole thing. Tomatoes are one of the few things that'll do that. So if I plant them up to here, this will be all roots. And you like to have lots of roots because if the plant can suck up a lot of moisture and doesn't run dry and you, oops, water it quite well, uh, then you don't get the, so much cracking in. I had a old client of mine that used to take newspaper and wet it up and throw it in the bottom of the hole because she said that it helped hold the moisture in and uh, she said she never had cracking tomatoes because of the newspaper would hold the moisture into the in the in the uh, in the hole I'm doing that <laughs> <laughs> so yeah <clears throat> so these guys I'm gonna put these in pots so I'll do the same thing too I'm gonna plant them really deep and that'll make it uh, like lots of roots in that pot there will be just full of roots You'll make it a lot sturdier, hey? That's right, yes. Right. Now, they have two growing forms. is determinate and indeterminate. Now, determinate is, uh, this is with the height. And determinate, it's like their height's determined. So they are a shorter plant. They don't keep growing. They stop at a certain point. So these mountain, mad, mountain merit are determinate plants. So you can see I have shorter stakes for them. And these ones here, these are the country taste tomatoes. They are indeterminate, so they have taller stakes. Your so tomatoes are going to get that tall? They'll get that tall, yep. That's about as tall as you. So I'll just, you know, tie them up as I go along. And now there's all kinds of different theories on growing tomatoes. A lot of people, uh, let's see if we can find them. There's a little... 
too small to have those yet. The but suckers? The little suckers, yeah. They start in, in the, where the axles, the axle of the leaf meets the stem there. I see one over there at the top. Oh yeah, yeah. So I, I don't bother taking those out. Um, I just let them grow, tie them up, and then you can see, uh, I guess I took them all down now, but usually I put rebar around the outer edge and then put a string around the whole thing and just tie them into a mass. And um, one year, I used to deadhead them, or not deadhead them, but take the suckers out and stuff, but one year I didn't get around to it and they still produce just fine. So now I don't bother with that. Hmm. And I just tie them into a big bunch here and I find they still ripen nicely. And it just saves me work. Yep. So, but at a certain point, um, say August, when the flowers are not, the flowers, the fruit that gets produced then is not going to even ripen. So at a certain point, I cut the tops off and then the energy can goes into the, the tomatoes that are on there. Because after a certain point, there's no point in having new little baby tomatoes because it's just too late. So even the indeterminate ones, you can cut the tops off at a certain point and then just let the energy go into what's on the plants. So that's your determinate, that's your indeterminate. And I choose my variety, tomato varieties for taste and for disease resistance. Uh, one of the worst things for tomatoes is blight and you can prevent that from not watering overhead. But mm. I, I, I don't have it uh, together to have my tomatoes in a separate area where I just water them underground or on the surface. They're just in here and they get watered with it when all the garden gets watered. So I choose tomatoes that are resistant to the early and late blights. Because they will get watered overhead. That's right, they will get watered overhead. I'm not gonna especially try to avoid watering this spot here. It's just too much work. So, um, and I've never had a problem with that so far. Knock on wood. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that's the, the tomato crop. So these are the hydrangea macrophylla. These are the hydrangeas that generally you grow in the shadier zones. So I'm not sure what happened last fall, last winter, but they got really hammered everywhere. This one's actually not too bad. It's got a little bit of sprouts on it. So now we're just gonna cut back all the stuff that doesn't have any shoots. And we'll see, we'll, we'll leave these ones tall for now. I'm gonna not do that one up there. And sometimes this has a little bud there, but it doesn't look very good. And then I'm going to decide on, I'm just gonna take these down a little bit more just so it balances it out a little bit more. That's not too bad. And then we'll watch. If, if this doesn't have much energy, we'll take it back down some more. But this one here, doesn't have any sprouts so we're just going to take a luckily it doesn't kill the plant um, but these usually bloom re more reliably on the old wood on this old wood here so we might not get much blooms this year we'll have to just see how it is but there's a new variety called uh, oh end the summer that's it and so I tried this end the summer now I only had it there for three or four years and then I moved so I don't know whether, it, as it got older, maybe it would have been better, but I found even on, it didn't reliably bloom on the, on the new wood very well. But down here in the cusp or New Denver or Silverton and, uh, you know, parts of the valley, usually it's pretty good. But this last winter was a tough one and uh, they got knocked pretty well back. Was it tough due to temperature or snowfall or well I think it was because it was so warm and lack then, of snowfall and then it got cold uh, so things were kind of knocked flat now the hydrangeas that are doing well are the ones by my patio and uh, Teresa and I shoveled the snow off the patio and we threw it on the hydrangeas and so uh, we'll take maybe a picture of them they're actually doing quite well so I think it was the snow cover that helped protect them uh, whereas these guys here, it was warm, not much snow, and then it got cold, so they didn't have that protection. Didn't get the winter they deserved. Didn't get the winter they deserved, mm. yeah. yeah. So if you have a macrophylla hydrangea, and macrophylla just means large leaf hydrangea, and it looks like this, well, you're not the only one. It, it happens 
you know happened to most of us so unfortunately but like I say it hasn't died and hopefully next winter will be a better winter and we'll get lots of blooms next year we'll see you in a year buddy yeah. so this is a perennial sweet pea and unlike the wild sweet pea the the viney one uh, it's actually very well made uh, very well um, it doesn't spread wildly it doesn't seed down it's, it's actually very nicely behaved and it doesn't bloom for a very long time but I'm a, I'm a plant collector so I just I, I enjoy it it's just a nice little bush and it stays nice and uh, together and has this nice little bit of blooms in the springtime just a cute little little plant can you pat it again <laughs> yeah, our little buddy. <laughs> Cute. Yeah. So I just want to do a little shot here of Teresa's greenhouse. Unfortunately, we've run out of greenhouse space because she does lots of plant propagation too. She has a landscape business as well. So she made this little temporary greenhouse and it works just great. So she had a plastic on a, on a roll and nailed it up to the top there and just hung it down. <laughs> and, yeah, these came from um, somebody's little um, little hut. They're disintegrated, so they gave me these things. And so she found them and put some boards on it and made two shelves and then just rolled the plastic down when it was cold. And so it just works great. So things don't have to be expensive to work. No, I use um, little spinach containers right. for my greenhouses. Right. So it's like a little mini greenhouse inside a greenhouse. Yeah, that's perfect. It really gets everything going. Yeah. Yeah, and then, and then reuse, recycle. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, that, that drives me crazy when I buy stuff in the stores, all that plastic. Well, yeah. yeah. I mean, we already have it. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, so that's Teresa's little greenhouse, and I'm just proud of her for constructing that. Well done. Where is she? So this is my friend Teresa. We share the land here, and she's just a wonderful helper. Help because it's a lot of watering here, <laughs> and so she helps with all that watering and and uh, words of advice like you got to stop for supper. <laughs> yeah, you don't need to do this today. <laughs> yes, Wait. That's right. Yeah, yeah. So it's nice that that we have this place we can share and that we enjoy gardening together and. Like I say, she has her own business too as well, and so she knows how it is like to run your own business. In the landscaping sector, That's no right. less, hey? Yep. Yep. So good yep. job over here. This yeah. is a beautiful greenhouse. So we were just again. admiring your greenhouse and thinking what a good job you did making it function. Yeah, well, it's warmer so the flowers are happier. That's right, yeah. And they'll be all planted in spaces in all my gardens that I take care of somewhere. Right. Yep. Here and there, give some away. Yeah. And it's never too late to plant some flowers, you know, if you have holes and you can't find anything at a garden center, then you have a little hidden... Right, because most of the stuff you started from seed. Yes. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, and so that's such an inexpensive way, too, to get plants. Yes. Yeah, yeah doing it yourself. <laughs> yeah. And, and for uh, those who are uh, at the lodge in the cusp, uh, Teresa looks after the gardens there. And what a job. Yes. Gorgeous out there. Yep. Thanks, Teresa. <laughs> <laughs>